Wisdom, like truth, always has a paradox at its heart. This basic fact is embedded in the heart of Medusa's myth. Beauty and horror are inextricably bound as alternating facets of the same magical figure. In her, beauty has the esoteric quality of strength, while horror makes that quality exoteric. As we explore the details of her story and show direct connections to other serpent goddesses as well as semi-divine women, please bear in mind the recurring theme of sea, serpent, stone, horse as the underlying symbolic chain of functionality in the following analysis. Mention of Medusa having once been a beautiful maiden prior to her being a snake-haired monster comes to us from the late classical period in the Metamorphoses of Ovid, who assumes his readers are already well acquainted with her story, as I do now with my viewers. He was a well-educated and well-respected poet in the Rome of his own time and would have had access to countless written works, many of which we may now safely assume to be lost, stolen, burned, or in whichever conceivable way now simply gone. In fact, this attribute he expounds, though given previously by others, makes a study of comparative mythology all the more intriguing. Let's do a little of that right now. Some accounts say Medusa was one of three sisters, others four. In both cases, she is somehow the only one who is not immortal, though their parents, Forcus and Quito, are the same for each. Some accounts refer to all the sisters together as the Gorgon, others to Medusa alone as the Gorgon. Her two named sisters are Uriel, she of the bellowing cries, and Steno, the forceful. Medusa was once a beautiful young maiden of Athena's temple. Actually, the earliest mention of her origin as a lovely young lady and temple guardian or protectress comes to us from Pindar, who refers to her in 490 BC as fair-cheeked Medusa. As Athenian temple maiden, it is her sacred duty to remain a virgin. She's known for her uniquely beautiful hair and is pursued by countless suitors, all of whom she refuses. Poseidon, known to the Romans as Neptune, comes along and plays Peeping Tom for a little while and then he rapes her. As is often the case among Greek and Roman mythological dynamics, the rape victim gets blamed and punished for the act, rather than the offender himself. Often when this happens, either the rape victim or her family are compensated with riches or livestock, or even some magical endowments. What's not often mentioned is the fact that Poseidon is already a known pedophile and rapist. He and Jupiter, or Zeus, both frequently disguised themselves as mortals or gods or even animals for purposes of seduction or rape. He did it to Erysichthon's daughter, Mestra. For Aeolius's daughter, he became a bull. For Aeolius's wife, he appeared as Enipius, the river god. For Basaltus, he disguised himself as a ram. For a blonde corn goddess, he became a horse. For Melantho, a dolphin. And most importantly for our purposes here, he appeared to Medusa as a bird. We're not told what kind of bird, just a bird. And he stole her maidenhood there in the sacred temple of Athena. Poseidon has been called the tamer of horses and is also cited as having created the horse from sea foam in a quest to create the most beautiful animal in the world so as to impress the goddess Demeter. Being the tamer of horses, one who subdues their nature, it is interesting to note that after what he does to Medusa, she has in her destiny a reclaiming of her original pure nature, and that is the moment when Pegasus is born, a wild horse now set free who has his own destiny in the stars. In this way, Medusa has ultimately beaten Poseidon and literally risen above him. 
Perseus travels through dangerous rocky country and thick woods and finally finds himself on a path into a large field wherein he sees countless statues of men and beasts. Each has a horrified expression memorialized forever from their last living moment when catching sight of the Gorgon, or one of them, depending which myth you're reading. The mere sight of her has petrified them, instantly transformed them to stone, but according to the Ovid account, not just stone, more specifically, to marble. As to her younger days as a beautiful temple maiden, Perseus mysteriously tells us, I have met someone who claims to have seen her in those days. We are not given even a clue as to who this might be. Perseus is as paradoxical a figure as Medusa. His own mother was sexually deceived and violated by Zeus, just as Medusa was by Poseidon. His mother was Danae, locked in a tower by her father where the god of gods came to her as a shower of golden rain. This is a reference to the Perseid meteor shower, during which the naked eye can see specific points of golden light, and so it can easily be likened to rain. Perseus has mastered the art of life and death, or medicine and poison, both of which are concentrated together in the head of a serpent. The head is where many ancient cultures tell us is the seat of the soul. Perseus, by the same severing stroke with which he masters this paradoxical secret of life and death, is also severing and usurping the power of woman, the power of the goddess, who better understands this secret. Man enters the scene and intellectualizes it. He has been trying to demonize and suppress that power ever since. Perseus carries away the head of Medusa in a silver bag slung over his back. He halts his flight, riding upon Pegasus, in the regions of the west, the kingdom of Atlas. Atlas was lord of Earth's furthest shores and of the sea which spreads its waters to receive the panting horses of the sun and welcomes his weary wheels. Atlas is the only observer of Medusa's head who does not turn to pure stone. He turns into a mountain. There is a place behind the chill slopes of Atlas, Ovid tells us, that is securely shut away behind a mass of solid rock. At the entrance to this spot dwelt two sisters, the daughters of Forcus, who shared the use of a single eye. In the earliest myths, there is only one Gorgon, but there are two snakes that form a belt around her waist. When one sister was passing the eye to the other, Perseus snatched it away and did not give it back until the sisters agreed to tell him where he could find Medusa. It is incredibly intriguing that the two sisters shared the eye between them by taking turns with it. These characteristics reveal that the ancients knew about Algol, being a binary star. It can be seen in the Perseus constellation as if a third eye upon Medusa's head. It's actually a triple star system. The binary pair rotates around the brightest central star. Algol comes from the Arabic Ras al Ghul, meaning demon star, later called by Hebrews as Satan's star. Its orbiting occurs over a period of about three days. For several hours of this three-day period, it appears to us as if to vanish or blink out. The combined magnetic field of this star system is roughly ten times that of the sun's. The modern medical term algology is a derivative of algol and refers to the study of pain. Even the word medicine shares this root. Algol is also the origin of the word alcohol, which dries us out and therefore literally petrifies us. The Chinese call algol by the name of deshi, meaning piled up corpses. Medusa is most often depicted as resembling a corpse, bug-eyed and bloated with the pale pallor of death, which is necessary for rebirth. 
Her common image is in fact based on the site of a corpse, and this image has been used since long ago to incite fear, whether on a shield for military opponents or over an oven to keep children away from its dangerous temperature. Perseus looks for her by using the bronze of his shield as a mirror, then finds her sleeping and decapitates her right then and there. Diodorus Siculus in the first century BC tells us about the weapon used. He is said, too, to have received from Vulcanus Hephaestus a blade made of adamant with which he killed Medusa the Gorgon. The deed itself no one has described. Adamant is a word often used to describe an imaginary rock or mineral of impenetrable hardness, like a diamond. It is also used to describe a magnet or lodestone, considered by some to be the philosopher's stone, precisely because of its magnetic properties. As her head rolls away, the winged white horse Pegasus is born from her bleeding body. So too was his brother, whose name is Chrysior. Although a horse's brother, he's often depicted as a young man, and none of the relative myths tell us what happened to him immediately after birth while Perseus rides into the sky on the back of Pegasus. While flying high, some drops of blood fall from Medusa's head and land on Libyan sand, whereupon new snakes are immediately born. From serpent to stone to horse to new snakes. Some legends, such as those from Pindar and Nonus, tell us that the Libyan double reeded pipe was invented to replicate the sound of Medusa's two sisters wailing at the moment of her death. Philip Gardner and Gary Osborne, in their book The Serpent Grail, write Why would a horse with wings? which indicate that it is a spiritual or heavenly being, spring from the blood of a serpent. The horse is symbolic of the astral vehicle that carries the shaman into the other worlds associated with the trance state. It was Perseus who chopped off Medusa's head, so it was the victor who benefited. But if the serpent bites you, you may become paralyzed, rigid like stone or you may develop the elixir or serum that saves lives. However, the body also becomes paralyzed as one goes through the Enlightenment experience. There are some intriguing connections between serpents and horses scattered through ancient world myths, specifically the unicorn. The horn of the unicorn is said to be an antidote to poison, but it is not only the horn that has healing properties. The blood of the unicorn is said to bestow eternal life. Aelian, a Greco-Roman author who lived about 200 years before the Common Era, tells us that the unicorn had a twisted horn, like the entwined snakes of the Caduceus. Today, horses are injected with snake venom to produce anti-venom. Wherever the hooves of Pegasus landed, New water springs gushed forth, most notably the Hippocrene upon Mount Hillicon of the Muses, wherefrom those who drink are imbued with poetic insight and inspiration. Aelian also writes that the home of the unicorn was Tibet and India, the very places that were once the homes of the Naga, the most powerful of the world's mystical serpent deities and India's shining ones. Speaking of India, we might now look at the etymology of Medusa's name with a little comparative mythology. Meda is a Sanskrit word with female connotations, meaning memory. It also happens to be one of the names for Sarasvati, who is Hindu goddess of learning, among other things. Meda is one who grasps and uses many concepts and ideas all at once. Another Hindu goddess is Manasa, also known as Vishahara, meaning destroyer of poison. She's known as the one who saved Shiva from dying by poison and is usually depicted as being covered with snakes. 
She gives us a tantalizing similarity to the two sisters who share an eye and to the star of Algol, being that one of Manasseh's eyes was burnt by her evil stepmother, Chandi. She is often called the One-Eyed Goddess. Metis is a titan goddess of the Greeks and a spouse of Zeus, whose name means wisdom and magical cunning. She is the mother of Athena, and Plato calls her the mother of creative ingenuity. Maat, also called Maet, is the Egyptian goddess of truth, justice, morality, and balance, upon whose name we derive the word mother. She regulates the dynamic interplay between above and below, mortals and gods, and tempers cosmological cycles and seasons. She is the female equivalent of Toth and Mercury and Hermes. The alternative spelling for her name, Mayat, is also the name of the Buddha's mother, which also happens to be one of the brightest stars of the Pleiades constellation. Ahura Mazda is the great god of Zoroastrian Persia, from the Proto-Iranian female name Mazda, which, like its Sanskrit cognate Medha, means wisdom. Ahura Mazda is alternatively called Asura Medha, the very same word for the Hindu principle of wisdom seen just a moment ago. The root word variations of Med, Met, and Mat which relate to all we're discussing here now, combine the shared qualities of mother and medicine and wisdom. We must also take note here of the pre-classical Greek culture of Minoan Crete, where several statuettes of a woman holding two snakes were discovered in temple repositories there in Knossos and dating from approximately 1600 BC. More figurines of her were discovered beneath several common homes of this time. Her name and story are unknown with absolute certainty, but she seems to me to be a kind of prototype for Medusa, and this may not even be just one mythical figure we're talking about. It could be simply a personification of a universal principle of feminine understanding of serpentine wisdom. They even share the same entranced, yet shocked and shocking expression, which seems to convey an intense enlightenment experience. According to the partially deciphered script discovered in Knossos, Linear A and Linear B, a spiraling series of symbols now proven to be an archaic form of Greek, her name or title, if we can trust the currently available translation, is Asasara or Asasarame. Either would offer a striking similarity to the Hittite Ishasara, which itself bears a resemblance to Sarasvati, Ishtar, Astarte, Ashtoreth, and of course, Isis. Perseus, in acquiring Medusa's head, is now able to claim a prize equivalent to the Holy Grail, his love, Andromeda by turning the great beast of the sea into stone before having a chance to devour her, a would-be sacrifice. Ovid epically nutshells the weight of the moment thusly. The girl stepped down, freed from her bonds, she who was at once the cause and the reward of his heroic deed. This is essentially the discovery of the Philosopher's Stone and arrival at this point is symbolically conveyed in a poetic-minded interpretation and appreciation of Medusa's story. Another lasting effect of this moment comes to us almost as a footnote. The victor himself washed his hands in the water drawn from the sea, and in case Medusa's head with its growth of snakes should be injured by the harsh sand, he made a soft bed of leaves on the ground covered it with seaweed, and there laid down the head of Forcus' daughter. The freshly gathered weed, still living and absorbent, drew into itself the power of the monster. Hardening at the touch of the head, it acquired a strange new rigidity in its leaves and branches. The sea nymphs tested this miracle, trying it on several twigs, and were delighted to find the same thing happening again. By scattering seeds from these plants over the waves, 
they produced more of the substance. Even today, coral retains the same nature, hardening at the touch of air. That which was a plant when underwater becomes rock when brought above the surface. Here we have a direct allusion to a very special power, the dualistic properties of which can be either separated according to which element it is exposed or show opposite effects at once. This is exemplified in the seaweed and coral. Medusa's head contains both a poison and its cure. The inherent principle here can be seen in the caduceus, the staff of Hermes, which is coiled by two snakes. Very pointedly, Within a snake's blood is found the antidote to its own poison. When the two are combined in the right proportions, what is produced is the vitriol of alchemy. This is why we see it today as a common medical symbol. This is also the basic operating principle behind what happens when you get your flu shot. You're given a little bit of the flu itself so that your immune system can kill it as well as be prepared for a potential future infection. Pseudo Apollodorus, writing in the 2nd century AD, refers us directly to this dualistic concept in his Bibliotheca when speaking of the surgeon Asclepius. For he had received from Athena the blood that had coursed through the Gorgo's veins, the left side portion of which he used to destroy people, but that on the right he used for their preservation, which is how he could revive those who had died. Even Orpheus sings of Medusa in a hymn, but in so doing likens her to Cerberus, the hound of Hecate. I did not come here to see the dim haunts of Tartarus, nor yet to chain Medusa's monstrous dog with its three heads and snaky ruff. I came because of my wife, cut off before she reached her prime when she trod on a serpent and poured its poison into her veins. I wished to be strong enough to endure my grief, and I will not deny that I tried to do so. But love was too much for me. Ovid goes on about Orpheus in second person. At his wife's second death, Orpheus was completely stunned. He was like that timid fellow who, when he saw three-headed Cerberus led along, chained by the middle one of his three necks, was turned to stone in every limb and lost his fear only when he lost his original nature, too. Cerberus, the three-headed hound, usually accompanies Hecate, the three-headed Greek goddess of doorways, crossroads, moon magic, and witchcraft. The three heads are generally indicative of the three major faces of the moon, waxing, full, and waning. So, all the more interesting that Medusa's name shares an obvious similarity with another Greek goddess called Medea, who is best known as being a witch and a priestess of Hecate. Hecate and Cerberus here remind us again of Algol, the triple-aspected star system. Later on in the Metamorphoses, we are given a possible mention of the snakes created from the blood that dripped from Medusa's head onto the sand beneath, as well as a possible allusion to Poseidon's having created the horse from sea foam. The Siconian women tear apart his body and scatter its parts in different places, just like Osiris. His head washes ashore on the island of Lesbos near Methymna. Here, as the head lay exposed on that foreign shore, its hair dripping with beads of foam, it was attacked by a savage snake. But Phoebus at last appeared and checked the snake in the very act of biting, turning its open mouth to stone and petrifying its gaping jaws. How interesting if this is one of the blood-borne snakes in the sand, since this time the snake itself is turned to stone. If so, it would be the only occasion in the relative mythology when the tables are turned. The fate of Medusa's head was a return to Athena in her temple, where Perseus brought it and left it, where long ago Medusa had been violated by the god of the sea. It is almost always a goddess, not a god, who is associated with serpents. Even the biblical Christ, 
whose name was not really so much a name as it was a title, meaning simply anointed one, a variation of the much earlier Hindu Krishna or Krishna, advises us, be ye wise as serpents and innocent as doves. The serpent in the Garden of Eden is at home in the tree, protecting it, not a visitor there come but to tempt Eve from Jehovah. The opposite is true. Jehovah is commanding her away from nature and gnosis. The serpent essentially tells her, there's no reason why you and all else should not have gnosis, which is direct knowledge and wisdom of universal consciousness. And the serpent is right. True wisdom and love do not exist as commands from a self-proclaimed jealous God, but as pure being, which is pure knowing. We're told that he is the only true God, yet he himself admonishes us, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, thus inadvertently admitting that there are other gods. One look around today, and at the last several thousand years, reveals with absolute clarity that our worldwide patriarchal society is not just spiritually imbalanced and impure, but downright sick. God is almost always named and worshipped in terms of He, Him, the Lord, Father, God. Why is it with the same frequency that one is laughed at or considered misled or even evil if doing the same in terms of she, her, the lady, mother, goddess? Isn't it about time we acknowledge her equal and balancing place beside her man? The justice and morality and balance of Ma'at is sorely needed today. Far too long has humanity subdued and subverted the medicine and wisdom of the mother goddess by all her names. Advises us, be ye wise as serpents and innocent as doves. The serpent in the Garden of Eden is at home in the tree, protecting it, not a visitor there come but to tempt Eve from Jehovah. The opposite is true. Jehovah is commanding her away from nature and gnosis. The serpent essentially tells her, there's no reason why you and all else should not have gnosis, which is direct knowledge and wisdom of universal consciousness. And the serpent is right. True wisdom and love do not exist as commands from a self-proclaimed jealous God, but as pure being, which is pure knowing. We're told that he is the only true God, yet he himself admonishes us, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, thus inadvertently admitting that there are other gods. One look around today, and at the last several thousand years, reveals with absolute clarity that our worldwide patriarchal society is not just spiritually imbalanced and impure, but downright sick. God is almost always named and worshipped in terms of He, Him, the Lord, Father, God. Why is it with the same frequency that one is laughed at or considered misled or even evil if doing the same in terms of She, Her, the Lady, Mother, Goddess? Isn't it about time we acknowledge her equal and balancing place beside her man? The justice and morality and balance of Ma'at is sorely needed today. Far too long has humanity subdued and subverted the medicine and wisdom of the mother goddess by all her names.